Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to be talking about the first expansion for the Taverns of Tiefenthal. This is a popular Euro game that came out maybe three years ago, and this is the first big box expansion for the game. It's called Zimmer Fry. The game's designed by Wolfgang Warsh, and it is a push your luck slash deck building uh, game where players are going to be uh, using uh, tavern makers to produce beer and to try to attract the best guests to their uh, tavern. In this expansion, uh, which is a modular expansion, there's four modules included in it, uh, you are going to be additionally opening an inn on top of your tavern. That's the main mechanism that's in it. I'm going to take a few minutes to show you the uh, four modules, uh, explain how they vary up the uh, base game, and I'll come back and let you know what I think about it. So this is a modular expansion that has four modules and you're going to be able to play whichever of those modules you prefer and you can combine them with the modules that are um, added in the uh, base game box in whatever combination you like. The rules go into more detail about that. The uh, first module is basically centered around these wine cubes each player is going to get if you're playing with this module a wine room and two wine cubes that go on it. This is a section of your tavern that could be upgraded just like any other section you could see here. And it will introduce two new types of cards into the game. There are going to be uh, little vintner, vintners, I guess, and then there are going to be quacks. And you can see those are the two types of cards. And these are going to be basically available to you, just like any other cards, except that I'll note that the quacks take beer to buy, so if you buy those, you can't buy a guest on the same term. And these uh, you could just buy one of as, as if they were any other card that costs money per turn. And the way that these work is, on your turn, when you're flipping cards up, if you flip up one of these vintners, they're going to go over here, and... At the end of the round, for each vintner you have here up to two, because you only have two wine cubes, you'll fill in the spaces on guests. So, for example, if I had a guy sitting here, I would fill in on the dice space one of those wine cubes because I have one of these drawn. And that just essentially acts as if it were the required die for this. So this guy would give me five money as if I had placed a five there. So by default... The, if you get the uh, two cubes, they have to go in the two people who are seated furthest to the right. And that includes if you have special chairs added onto it. So those are pretty simple. The quacks, the way that they work, they're going to, just, like I said, be a card that you buy. And when they come up, you can either simply t take one money, and then they'll just cycle back in through your deck. Or you could discard them out of your deck and just return them to the supply. And in that case... Uh, you will get to reactivate any uh, card that ha has been activated as if it had a die on it. So, for example, if I return this back to the supply, took it out of my deck, I would then get five, uh, five money from this card twice. The once for the die, or the in this case, the wine cube, and once for discarding the quack. So that's how they work. So that is the first um, module for the expansion. The uh, second one expands this room up here. And it basically adds a series of guest rooms. So what you'll do is you'll put these here. And basically you play the game as normal. Except now when you draw the noble cards. So in the base game whenever you draw noble cards. They, any number of them that you get would take up one seat in your bar. Of course these are how, the main way you're going to get points over the course of the game. But the way that works here is. Um, first of all, it gives you another room that you could upgrade, so for 8 money you could flip this over. Second, um, the f whenever you draw a noble with this uh, expansion, you could tuck it into one of these four room spaces. So, for example, I could tuck it in here. And what that is saying is that if during the dice drafting phase you take a 3 you activate the power that's underneath that. So there's two, three, four, five. If you take the die with a noble tucked under that space, you'll immediately get this instant benefit here. It doesn't commit the die to that space. It's just if you draft that die during the die, die phase to place later, you'll be able to activate that. You can only activate each one of them uh, once. And by default, you can only tuck one noble at the start. If you ever upgrade this uh, building, you'll simply be able to tuck two nobles in there instead. So there's four different powers here that you could act, you know, activate with the nobles. This one is you just move up once on each of those tracks, so your 
money and your beer holdings. This one here is when you, you um, take that die, so if you take a three and you have a noble tucked under here, you will immediately take the top card off your deck and put this on it. So for example, I might put this on it like that. This guy's not going to take a seat, and he just acts as if any other card that you've drawn, except that at the end of your turn, during your cleanup phase, you could choose to put that on the top of your draw pile or in your discard pile. So it just gets you an extra card for the round. Uh, this one here lets you do an upgrade of a card. Essentially, you could upgrade one of your basic cards for one of the, uh, the guests that cost three, or you could do an upgrade of a card that you already got that cost two more than it costs. So it's just an upgrade a card. There are also some other special cards that can be upgraded with that. I, I'll let you look at the rules for that. And this last one just lets you move one extra space on the uh, Monastery track. So pretty simple. It just basically gives you um, a space that you could tuck your nobles. So again, if let's say you're on this upgraded side and you had two nobles tucked already and you do a third noble, they would just take up a seat in your tavern as normal. And um, any nobles beyond the ones that you could fit in this area here just work normally. So it just will take one or two nobles out of the way. So that is pretty much how module C works, or I guess that's B. Uh, the other thing that that one does add though is it gives you a card that starts in your discard. This is basically a priest card, and he comes out in his tree like any other guest. He doesn't give you money, though. He would just uh, give you a movement on the reputation track if you uh, have him come up in the future. The module C. Uh, first thing is it will put a critic in your deck. This is basically the same thing, except it moves you along on the reputation track down here as opposed to the uh, Monastery track with the Priest. So if you're using this module, but the main thing of this module is basically each player is going to get a unique player power tile, which we'll clip in over here. So this one, for example, it basically says that threes and fours could be treated as if they were any value for that player. And each player is going to have their own unique powers. So just to show you some of the examples of them, this guy here, if he does upgrades, they cost two less. And if he does upgrades by discounting them, by having cards out, he actually puts those cards in his discard card, card pile so he doesn't have to discard cards when he's turning them in for the upgrade. So that's pretty nice. This guy kind of works like one of the guys from Marco Polo. You basically will get a stack of these pink tiles and you just draw one at random and every round during the end of the cleanup phase, you could just you know, get get a log book entry, get another red cube, get um, two beer. So it'll tell you what phase that'll activate in. Sometimes it'll be during cl the cleanup, sometimes during your action phase. Just take two money, etc. So he'll just get a whole stack of those and get one each round. So that's kind of fun. This guy here, he gets an entirely different uh, guest book than the other people. He his just has different, better bonuses for filling that in. Um, you would only obviously play that if you were playing with the guestbook module. This one here, it looks like um, whenever she uses a white die to uh, satisfy a guest who gives money, she gets an extra money. So just an easier way to get money. And there's uh, I think eight or nine of those, something like that. And that's module C. It just gives every player a unique power. And the last module, which I'll just kind of slide this over uh, just to show you that is tied to this board. So the way this works, first of all, um, each player is going to have a set of these three tokens. It'll put them to the side here, and it's going to give you three goals. I'll mention that this is the only module that's language dependent, so I did have to do a translation on those. I just uh, printed out some labels and just wrote what was on there in English. I'll print this, uh, or I'll upload the, these labels to Board Game Geek, but it, it's literally the only text that's in the expansion beyond the uh, instructions. So what this is going to do is you're, there's these 12 tiles included in the game. You're just going to take six of them at random, turn three up one way, three up the other way, and you'll end up with this board set up for all players where they're going to have three objectives that they have that they can complete. And if you meet the objective on the, the left, you'll be qualified to do a one-time bonus on the right. So just to show you, for example, what's here, this one here, it says the Holy Spirit, if you reach the fifth space in the monastery track. So if a player does that, what they'll do is they'll take their token here, 
turn it over here, flip it to the other side. That First of all, they'll get five points for that at the end of the game. But then they'll also have this bonus on this side indicating one time during the game they could do this bonus. So in this one here, during one of their phases, they could roll all of their personal dice regardless of whether or not they drew waitresses. So they'd get to roll all three personal dice. Once they do that, if they choose to do that some point during the game, they'll just take that and put that by their tavern, and they'll score those five points at the end. So it's a nice way of tracking it. It's like, if it's over here, you haven't earned it. If it's here, you could still use this power once. Once you've used the power once, you just put that in your area. So just to show you some of the examples of what these are, this objective is you have to buy one nobleman with beer. So just, you know, buying a noble with beer, just pretty basic action. If you do that, you can use any numbered die and any number of them in on the uh, the cart space. So it normally would be one and six. Instead, you could put any dice there. Uh, this one is if you have four beer in your warehouse at the end of the uh, round. So in order to do that, you'd have to upgrade your warehouse. Then you would get to uh, fill up your safe, your gold safe, uh, completely at the end of the round. So these are just all nice one-off bonuses that you would get and even if you don't particularly want this bonus if you do do it you get five points so that might be an incentive to do it if you manage to complete all three bonuses and you get the uh the you not only get the 15 points but you get to take a mare card there's these mare cards one per player you can only ever have at most one of these and what these do is like any other card they'll go on top of your deck any die could be used to activate them for that much many money and at the time you, you get it, uh, you instantly could upgrade any section of your tavern, although you won't get a noble for doing that like you would normally. So those are basically the uh, four modules for the expansion. Like I said, they're mix and match, but that shows you how the game will differ with these modules versus the base game. Okay, so that is uh, Zimmer Fry, our... Um rooms available I believe is how that would translate essentially vacancies for the hotel that you'll be running. Uh, the game like I said has four modules in it and the each of those modules uh, could be used in concert with each other or individually. Um, unlike the modules in the base game, the base game also had four modules in it, but they were meant in the base game to be built successively upon each other. So if you wanted to play with module three, you used also modules one and two, and so on. Whereas here, you could use any of those base game f modules, however complex you want that game to be, but you could mix and match each of the four modules here um, into whatever configuration of the base game you're going to, to play with. Um, I will say that this does uh, add a lot of variety to the game. The base game, I think, because of the way that those modules work, it sounds great that you're going to get four modules in the box. But essentially, um, if you're going to be using all four of them every game, you'll be using everything in the box. Whereas here, you could take things in, put things out. The manual for this game does say that, uh, generally speaking, you, you know, it will be a very complex game if you use all four modules at the same time. But I have to say that I don't really find that to be the case. I don't think that any of the individual modules adds a great deal of rules complexity. So um, I wouldn't say that combining them all makes something unwieldy. Um, although you might have preferences about which ones you want to include or not. Um, sp speaking specifically about the four modules, that first one, which is mainly centered around the wine cubes, which gets you extra activations, I think that Generally speaking, I would play that with every game going forward. It doesn't add anything um, except for maybe a few rules that there's only two new cards that are going to be introduced and it ups the uh, press your luck feeling of the game. If you get those wine maker cards, it essentially means that you'll have bigger turns. And I think generally speaking, bigger turns is the the main thing you're going to get from playing with this expansion. There are some cards in there that, which seem like they're put... Um, in your deck at the start of the game if you're using certain modules that seem designed to slow the game down uh, so those bigger turns are harder to come by if unless you get rid of those cards but um, generally speaking I think that this is a, a game where you could expect higher higher scoring uh, than in just playing with the uh, base game alone indeed they do include even though the player count hasn't changed more nobles cards which are the main scoring cards so th I think the expectation is you will have higher scores playing with some of these uh, some of these uh, expansions. 
Uh, so the first one I think is, is a no-brainer. You're going to want to use it most times. The second one seems pretty good as well. Um, es essentially, that's the one where you're going to be tucking your nobles. Um, it just, uh, again, it is a way to mitigate the luck of drawing that first noble. Um, and it gives you like an instant bonus, which is nice. It just is a one-off bonus. And the fact that you can pick that bonus um, is really uh, a nice strategic twist to that dice drafting pe period of the uh, game where... Generally speaking, you were just taking what was getting passed to you, you know, trying to plot your turn a little bit, but um, it just adds one more dimension to that um, element of the game. So the variable player powers, I think, um, might be a little bit more controversial than the first two parts of the expansion, essentially because um, there's qu questions of balance, I think. Um, the base game does have the ability to have a staggered start uh, starting decks, um, or having, you know, so it has cards in it and you pick a card and players will start with different components or you know, various places on the tracks or whatnot. And this really takes that to the next level where you're having a completely distinct player power which the other players don't have. Um, I think that's great if you want variety. Um, I'm not sure that every game you'd want to play it because it, that's probably the part of the, the uh, expansion that does add the most rules because every individual player will have their own um, extra rule or two, although they're not that complicated. Uh, I think overall it, it's probably a good ex addition to the uh, base game, but it is a, something that might be a mileage may vary because some of them might prove to be stronger than others. And then the last ex part of the expansion are the individual player goals, or, or I'm sorry, the group player goals and rewards. Um, this definitely um, changes the feeling of the game a little bit insofar as they are so lucrative in terms of being worth five points each, giving you access to a pretty powerful, in some cases, one-time bonus. And then also, if you complete all three of them, you get a free upgrade, which is more points. Um, because of all those factors, most players in most games where you're playing with those are going to chase them. So because of that, um, it might make this game feel a little bit uh, directed in a way that it didn't before. This isn't the most open-ended of deck building slash engine building games to begin with. And now if you're putting out three you know, low-hanging fruit, in some cases, uh, player goals, all which are going to give you pretty immediate uh, rewards, it will, t I think, tend to channel players into those particular goals. Um, so, you know, again, I think that that's something that... Well, I, I, so far, because of the variety of the goals, it's been interesting just to try to, to play with them, but it's not necessarily something that I would want to play with every time I'm going to play the game because it does, constri if not constrain your strategy, you're certainly f capable of not doing them. It does make players tend to focus on the same things, which is a little bit less interesting, perhaps, than having more options without anything beyond your own volition saying, you know, I want to go after this or that. So, um... Those are basically what I think about the uh, four parts of the expansion. I will say that only one thing in the expansion, I'll reiterate, uh, the actual player goals um, uh, tiles have any text on them. Everything else is language independent. I don't think that this is confirmed yet for a U.S. release, um, and I do think that the base game is going to be changing publishers, so hopefully once they get that sorted out, um, they'll republish the base game and republish the expansion in the US, but in the meantime I think that's relatively speaking a pretty easy thing to import and do a translation of. You could certainly just use a crib sheet or I've uploaded the label file that I used uh, to create the English paste ups um, onto Board Game Geek, so that's available to, to uh, download if you wanted to do that. Um, certainly it's uh, not, uh, you know, I, I'm a, a gamer from years back where you know it was very common to use pay stops on German games because never there were never English uh, versions printed you know 15 or 20 years ago of many games so uh, me pay stops don't scare me but um, I understand that a lot of people don't enjoy you know playing games if it has translated text on the actual game components and I understand that but if you are looking for uh, more varied experience to Taverns of Tiefenthal, um, and one that really doesn't make the game feel particularly uh, more complex, just more more variety, having bigger turns, which is what you want out of this game, I think, generally speaking. Uh, I would recommend the first expansion, uh, Taverns of Tiefenthal, Zimmer Fry. Thanks for watching.